Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to ending corporate domination and creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Charles Chuck Johnson. Uh, Charles is the director of the Joint Task Force on Nuclear Power with the Oregon and Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. And we welcome you back. You were here just a couple months ago, maybe yep. not even that long ago. About a month ago. About a month ago, okay. And uh, we were talking about um, nuclear uh, energy, and we were talking about small nuclear module reactors, and, and, and a bill that was in the Oregon legislature. Right. Uh, that bill uh, got killed. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. Talk thankfully. about that for just a minute. Yeah. Um, I guess go ahead and start talking about that. Yeah. Uh, the SB 990 uh, would have created a, a, a special exemption from our state law that uh, requires that before any new nuclear plants get built in Oregon that there be a permanent uh, disposal site for the high level waste that's generated by by those plants and that they have a contract to uh, to have that waste disposed. Um, this was a state law that was passed by the voters in 1980 and uh, there still is no permanent repository so uh, the people who think that these new small modular reactors, which are being designed right now, there actually haven't been any that have been built yet, um, are a good idea, tried to get an exemption in the state law that says that you, uh, if you have a reactor smaller than 350 megawatts, which is still a pretty large reactor, mm -hmm. it's about maybe a third the size of a normal nuclear plant, um, you wouldn't have to uh, abide by that by that state law. Also uh, said that the state law currently requires that any new nuclear plant be put to a vote by the state's voters, and this would uh, only require that local cities and counties where the plant would be sited would would have to vote on it, not okay. the entire state. Right. Okay. So it was killed in the House. It, it passed the Senate before we were really aware of it. Yeah, very strongly. Uh, I was surprised. Uh, there were only like three votes against it. There were four. four. There were four, four votes, votes against it. Yeah, right. exactly. And but when we found out about it, when we found out about it, uh, there we we got a lot of support from the mainstream environmental community on it, which was very heartening. Uh, the uh, Oregon League of Conservation Voters, Sierra Club, Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, and uh, to a lesser extent, Columbia Riverkeeper were all involved in doing some lobbying uh, and uh, and we activated our network, uh, Lloyd Marbet with the Oregon Conservancy Foundation and a bunch of different groups got involved in, in uh, fighting uh, that bill and we even uh, enlisted the support of uh, former Governor uh, Barbara Roberts who uh, signed an opinion uh, column in the Oregonian oh, yeah. uh, opposing changing the law. Yeah. Um, so. Um, it never, it had a hearing in the House Committee, the House Energy and Environment Committee, but it didn't have a work session and died. Uh, and died. So yes. We, so we celebrate a victory. Yes, right. indeed. All right. Great, good, good. So let, let's, let's talk about the only operating nuclear power plant in the Pacific Northwest, the Columbia Generating Station. Right. Um, how is it that that is the only one? Uh, how, how did it come to be? Give us a little history. Uh, it is uh, one of five reactors that was being built by what was known as the Washington Public Power Supply System, WPPSS, acronym spelled WHOOPS, Whoops. and that was the name they, they <laughs> called themselves even, uh, which as these reactors got further and further behind schedule and more and more over budget, they regretted having that nickname of WHOOPS. But um, especially after the Three Mile Island accident, revealed you know what a meltdown could mean to mm -hmm. a community so uh, in any case the Washington public power supply system consisted of I think it was well it varied from reactor to reactor but somewhere in the neighborhood of a hundred utilities per reactor bought shares uh, of these five different reactors um, the first three were guaranteed by Bonneville. Bonneville signed a contract with them for what they called net billing, whereby uh, even if the plants weren't finished uh, or whatever their costs were, 
Bonneville agreed to make these utilities whole and mm. purchase it at, at oh. their costs. Um, then as time went on, when Don Hodell was the Bonneville Power Administrator in the mid-70s, uh, we were still having increases in electricity that they interpreted as meaning we're gonna go, uh, that we're going to go on indefinitely. And they felt that additional reactors were going to be needed in the region. So uh, Bonneville encouraged the public utilities in the region to um, build two more, but didn't Congress had limited their ability to guarantee the price or the, 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 the covering the costs, so they couldn't offer that contract. Those were whoops four and five projects. Um, by the early 80s, all of these projects were in deep financial trouble, behind schedule, um, and uh, beyond really the capability of the whoops utilities to manage properly. Um, and whoops, four and five defaulted, the largest municipal bond default in the history of the United States up till that point. Uh, so people were receiving 10 cents on the dollar for mm. their, uh, or less, you know, sometimes yeah. nothing for, uh -huh. their, uh, for their bonds, which were utility bonds, which even though they were being sold as junk bonds, it, that didn't create a, uh, the uh, red flag that it should have for enough of these unfortunate investors who oh, lost yeah. their money. The, the other three we're still paying for. Um, one was finished um, and the, uh, the other two were canceled. Whoops, two was finished. Whoops, one and three were canceled by the Bonneville administrator mm -hmm. uh, because uh, he realized, uh, this was uh, Peter Johnson in the mid 80s, that you know, demand for electricity had, had uh, flattened out, uh, mostly due to cost. Increased uh -huh. costs, consumers figured out ways to conserve. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, an energy intensive industry was less likely to be uh, attracted to the Northwest because the power prices were going up and making it more like the rest of the country. Yeah, so we used to have all the aluminum uh, factories along the Columbia River and those all left there. Right. right. They were very inefficient plants. Mm -hmm. uh, they were old plants that were not uh, energy efficient at all, but because they had these incredibly cheap power contracts, they could have, it made sense economically for the companies to keep operating them. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, they stopped, mm -hmm. you know, they, uh, and as those plants were shut down, then the demand for electricity was even less yeah, right. because you had, um, uh, they, aluminum plants, these special deals with aluminum plants, uh, soaked up about a quarter of, of the region's electricity. Whoa. So uh, this big demand that was predicted by Bonneville didn't, didn't come. Mm -hmm. In fact, it flattened out in the, uh, in the 80s. And so they canceled Whoops 1 and 3. They, the, uh, uh, there was a, a new contract manager who actually was pretty competent, uh, unfortunately for us, I, I would say, and he was able to get Whoops 2 back uh, onto uh, a schedule where it was completed, and it's been running since uh, 1983. And that's the Columbia Generating Station. They renamed it. They, mm -hmm. they thought that Whoops, at a certain point, it took them until 1999 <laughs> to decide that Whoops was a bad name for a reactor, and so at that point they renamed it the Columbia Generating Station. No and mention of nuclear in it. Right. It sounds like a dam, mm -hmm. and uh, and then the name of the organization was changed to Energy Northwest. Uh -huh. um, the state of Washington reorganized uh, Whoops in the uh, late eighties. Uh, instead of this unwieldy group of a hundred utilities voting their shares, they winnowed it down to twenty-seven Washington-based utilities. So none of the Oregon utilities or Idaho utilities who were had b bought into this program were included in the in mm -hmm. the state law. But so it's PUDs and municipal utilities, publicly owned utilities uh, in Washington State. Twenty-seven of them that are that are the governing board for this um, this reactor. Yeah. So how, how old is this reactor now? It's thirty uh, two years, thirty-three years old now. Yeah. 
And it came up, or actually it wasn't up for a renewal of the license, but uh, a few years ago, I remember they extended the license for 20 years. Yes, um, it should it should be reaching the end of its original lifetime. Uh, these all these reactors were designed to to run for 40 years, and um, the nuclear power industry by the late 90s was realizing that they just were not going to build replacement reactors. So as some of the first ones began to come to the end, end of their 40-year time limit, they petitioned uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to extend it another 20 years. So basically the NRC agreed and uh, encouraged reactors throughout the country to apply and, and so far they've granted everyone who's requested it, mm -hmm. including the Columbia Generating Station. Um, this is problematic as far as we're concerned. These, these plants um, take a lot of wear and tear. Uh, the heat, um, the physical heat and the radioactive uh, bombardment of components within these plants uh, wears down uh, the metal parts and uh, the systems more rapidly than, uh, than any other type of an industrial plant, mm -hmm. virtually any other type. Okay. There are some others that are kind of rough on machinery as well, but it's, it, this is, and, and they're just, because this is a new, new industry in terms of pushing the outer limits of how long you can operate it, um, this is really kind of an experiment. Um, the oldest reactor in the world right now is 49 years old. Hmm. Um, they don't have, there are no 60 year old reactors. Is, is that in the United States or? There's one in the United States and there's one, uh, there's a couple in Switzerland that are 49 years old. The Swiss are planning on phasing all of their reactors out. They haven't set a time certain for it, but mm -hmm. they've agreed that they're uh, like Germany and, and uh, some other countries that they're going to completely get out of the nuclear power okay. business. Yeah. Yes. And, and then the one in the United States is Oyster Creek, it's 49 years old, mm -hmm. and they have agreed to shut down in 2019. So that one also is not going to, definitely not going to last 60 years. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Good, yeah. So how much, how much electrical energy does uh, the Columbia Generating Station generate for the Pacific Northwest? A uh, sizable amount, um, you know, in, in the terms of the overall use of electricity in the Northwest, it's about 4% of our electricity is generated at the Columbia Generating Station. Um, it's 1,200 megawatts, uh, and it's about 10% of Bonneville's uh, electricity is generated there. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's equivalent of one of the larger dams, essentially. Oh, okay. um, and uh, but it's it's more expensive to operate than any of the of the uh, other uh, assets that Bonneville has by far. Hmm. Um, and uh, could could yeah. that amount be replaced by solar and wind? That amount could definitely be replaced by solar and wind, and in fact. Uh, it could be a, a place replaced uh, affordably, um, according to the study that we just commissioned from local economist Robert McCullough, mm -hmm. and uh, it's in line with with what we're seeing uh, in other parts of the country, particularly California, where they've gone to wind and solar even more aggressively than we are here. Um, solar doesn't necessarily sound like a logical thing to build in the Northwest, but. Uh, we have some really good sites for solar, and there's been a, a quite a bit of development in Idaho in recent years. Mm -hmm. Southern, uh, s southeastern Oregon, Lake County, um, there's uh, some big um, solar projects being planned, and they get an awful lot of sun there. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the 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 challenge with wind and solar, of course, is the intermittency, mm -hmm. um, and so you have to have something to back it up when it's not producing electricity. With our hydro system, that's a pretty good, you know, you can, you can back up an awful lot of wind and solar with the hydro system in our current, uh, our current portfolio. Um, as you get more and more and try to eliminate more and more of um, the uh, carbon-based electricity, re replacing the CGS is, is very doable, 4% of the electricity in the Northwest. Mm -hmm. But as you get into replacing the 30% uh, uh, plus that's, that's uh, coal and, and natural gas, then you may start to, you know, 
with current technology have trouble replacing all of it. Mm -hmm. But well, technology is improving. But, but, yeah, I was just going to say, right. and, and, and of course, one of the problems is this question about is it going to be available you know, with solar and wind, is it going to be available when it's needed? And part of the answer to that is having battery systems. Right. Right. Battery systems and pump storage. Um, there's a company called National Grid that runs the grid in, in Great Britain and has assets elsewhere in the United States. And they're, they're promoting uh, two pump storage uh, projects, one uh, next to the John Day Pool, John Day Dam, uh, which would use a, an aluminum uh, smelter's uh, water right to pump water uh, to the top of a of uh, of the bluff, and then run it back down through turbines. So mm -hmm. it's essentially a giant water battery oh. uh, system. Mm -hmm. uh, and because it uses an existing water right and only needs to use about a month's worth of of pumping to. Uh, Replenish itself on an annual basis, um, it wouldn't have a fish impact. You could you could fill that reservoir at a uh, time that was advantageous in terms of fish passage. Oh, okay. So, so you pump the water up to the reservoir, and then as you need it, you uh, add more water you, in, yeah, right, to okay, the system. and then you release it down through the turbines. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and and then it runs on a cycle, uh -huh. its own its own cycle that's separate from the river. Oh, uh, okay. Um, and there's a similar project uh, being developed in in uh, the the southern part of Oregon, right on the along the intertie with California, uh, where it can would be really useful for augmenting solar power going north or wind power going south or mm -hmm. whatever. There's uh, exchange between regions is another really important way to try to balance out power um, in the future because. Mm -hmm. uh, as we become more sophisticated in trading, then uh, people who have excess power uh, will be able to shift it uh, in smaller and smaller time increments back and forth and, and keep the system balanced. Okay, all right, yeah. So I, I know that you are involved with some efforts to close the Columbia Generating Station down. So tell us what that activity looks like. Well, uh, five years ago, uh, PSR and a number of groups uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility in Oregon and Washington and, uh, and several other groups, including the Alliance for Democracy, um, realized that uh, the reactor we have at Hanford, the Columbia Generating Station, is uh, of nearly identical design uh, to the ones that melted down in Japan during the earthquake and tsunami. Mm -hmm. So we uh, formed a campaign to try and close it down, convince the utilities that own it which are, as I said, these 27 publicly owned utilities uh, that uh, are on the board, plus the Bonneville administrator. The Bonneville administrator actually has the power to close that, that reactor as well, though uh, he is unlikely to do so without a lot of uh, push from the utilities that are buying the power from him. Mm -hmm. And thus far, we haven't been able to generate it. There's an awful lot of loyalty that goes back to the old whoops days um, the people there are p publicly owned utilities in the Tri Cities area where this plant is located, and they have about a thousand workers there, uh, who are very uh, uh, furious uh, at any mention of the thought of closing this reactor. Mm -hmm. um, so, thus far, we've only convinced uh, the city of Seattle to take a position that they favor uh, closing it and replacing it with carbon-free electricity. Uh, the city of Portland just recently passed a resolution. Portland doesn't get power from the CGS, but their resolution states that that um, their goal is to be carbon free and also nuclear free uh, by 2050, 2035 in terms of uh, uh, electricity generation. And um, w so we're we have Oregon utilities that we need to be talking to. Uh, we've started conversations with Eugene Water and Electric Board, which gets a good chunk of its power from Bonneville. And uh, we have other utilities in the area, and if people would, uh, such as Canby, uh, Forest Grove, McMinnville, uh, which get their power from, uh, part of their power from Bonneville. And if uh, listeners and watchers are, uh, are interested in working on, on talking to those utilities and getting them involved, we could definitely use your help. 
Uh, we also have a statewide ballot measure going in Washington State, um, which uh, we're using as an organizing tool um, for our local campaigns there. But it would, if it got on the ballot, allow Washington voters to decide whether they wanted to continue to operate the Columbia Generating Station. And we're hoping to build momentum for that in the coming years. Okay. All right. And so people who wanted to be involved in either effort could contact you in the yes. positions for social responsibility to get plugged in. Right. Right. Excellent. Excellent. Good. Yeah. And, and we are continuing also to oppose this small modular reactor proposal that's being the, the first one would be built in Idaho. But there's an awful lot of push in both Oregon and Washington to try and allow them to be built here as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and in Oregon, it's due to the fact that the company is a spin-off, New Scale Company is a spin-off of the Oregon State University en uh, Nuclear Engineering Department. It's owned by uh, Floor Corporation of Texas, but um, it's got matching grant from the federal government to finish its design, which it's hoping to have finished with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission by 2020. And they're hoping to have it this the first of its kind plant built in uh, in Idaho by 2026. Yeah. So, you know, per the standard operating procedure in the nuclear uh, business, you know, if they want to have it done by 2030, it will be probably 2035, 2040, or maybe even later before they actually do that. Well, that's that's been the, uh, yeah, that's definitely been the pattern, and, and New Scale went from saying they were going to have this first plant done in Idaho by 2023 to 2026. They were saying as late as November and December of last year, they'd have it done by 2023. They've already pushed right. it back three years. Right. And I assume that the reason why they didn't actually build this first one here in Oregon is because we had this uh, bill right. uh, that they were trying to, uh, to overturn. Correct. Uh, and Washington has some, some barriers as well, dating to back to the whoops mm -hmm. era. Their, their barrier is that it requires, if you're going to sell bonds to build anything larger than 350 megawatts, and the new scale system is a 600 megawatt system, even though they're mm -hmm. individual reactors of 50 megawatts each, um, then you have to refer it to a statewide vote. Uh, yeah. They tried to pass an exemption to that, but we blocked that in the Washington legislature. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so they tried to block it up there too. Okay. Yeah. Well, th this is this is this <laughs> that's a, another small victory to, yeah, to celebrate. That was right? last yeah. year. Uh -huh. uh, this year, they they the Tri Cities is trying to get a factory to build the small modular reactors. So when New Scale actually gets into production, they're going to have a factory to build the modules that'll go to Idaho, uh -huh. and so uh, there was a bill in the Washington legislature to exempt them from the business and occupations tax, uh, their business tax, so we, and we, we defeated that as well. Uh, so. Yeah, so uh, We have some good support in the House in, in uh, Washington State. For so another, another industry that <laughs> looks to the public to subsidize them. Of course. Ooh, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately, we're, we're almost out of time. We, we've, got, uh, we've got just four and a half minutes left, and okay. I need some of that time. So um, we had wanted to talk about the general condition of the nuclear industry worldwide. So right. can, can you just give a real short summary? Well, uh, this was a horrible, horrible year for nuclear power, and they've had a series of years that haven't been that great. This year, um, Westinghouse Corporation uh, declared bankruptcy in the United States. Um, they are the nuclear, uh, they were purchased by Toshiba Company, uh, and they're, uh, we're, we're in the process of building four uh, nuclear power plants in the southern United States, and um, they had so many cost overruns and took on so much, uh, billions and billions of dollars of, of, of loss that they decided to declare bankruptcy, and, and these uh, projects are very much in question at this point. The French nuclear power industry is in the same position. If they didn't have, if it wasn't basically a state-owned operation, they, they would have also declared bankruptcy. Uh -huh. But the French taxpayers are having to pick up all the cost overruns that are happening on their behind schedule reactors there. Um, the South Korean government, just they just elected a new government mm -hmm. that's against nuclear energy uh, with the United States and Japan and, and France having difficulty. Uh, the pro-nuclear promoters were looking to South Korea as being the, the one uh, 
non-communist or, or uh, friendly uh, country uh, mm -hmm. to the West that uh, would be developing nuclear energy around the world and, and this new government is slamming that shut. They aren't mm -hmm. even gonna finish the reactors that they were in the process of wow. building in Korea, mm -hmm. South Korea. Wow. So at this point it's China and Russia are the gleaming hope for uh, new nuclear in the world. Oh, and that's, okay. it's a very odd situation. Okay, all right. Um, and, and then I was reading also that there are, you know, there was an expectation that uh, that there would be 15 new nuclear reactors up and running this year, and then they scaled that number back, and it looks highly unlikely that they'll even be able to match their lower expectation. Well, that's it. I mean, the, the, the new orders have been, after Fukushima, orders kind of went down, mm -hmm. and as more and more financial problems developed with the ones that had been ordered, it just, it's cr the pipeline is, is shrinking. Mm -hmm and the ones that are in the pipeline are taking longer to complete. That's so this right. is really a dying industry. Right, yeah. In fact, one, uh, one uh, pro-nuclear journalist uh, wrote, the industry is in crisis. It looks even more like a 20th century industrial dinosaur, unloved by investors, the public, and policymakers alike. The crisis could prove terminal. Right. So that's a, that's a good way to end our program. Thank you very much for being here. It's great. All Thank right. you, David. Great. Good. Thank you. So we've been talking with Charles Johnson, director of the Oregon-Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility Task Force on Nuclear Power. If you want more information on that program, please visit their website at www.o, excuse me, oregonpsr.org slash nuclear underscore power. Don't forget that our programs are also view, viewable on YouTube. Just search for Populist Dialogues. When you are watching on YouTube, don't forget to like the program and then share it as well. Thank you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.